Hello and good morning or good afternoon in the UK to everybody and thanks for joining us again for day two of webinar week. This is a series brought to you by Beyond Pulse and our coach education department where we are trying to, to come together um, in tough times faced by everybody and, and share some, some insight and free support for, for all the coaches looking to do great work in the game with um, both the staff and the players with which you work. So um, thank you everybody for, for being with us today. Um, Unexpected guest, Mr. Mark Wilson. So that's that's brilliant. Uh, Mark is, of course, the, the co-founder of Beyond Pulse, and will tag team this with me. Um, and then our our special guest, Mr. Dan Abrahams. Um, Dan needs very little introduction to many of you on the line. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of one, and then a little bit of a pretense as to why I am so excited to be able to welcome him today. So obviously, as um, as a world leading sports psychologist, Dan has been able to spend time with some of the world's top sports organizations and, and elite athletes and specifically soccer players on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Dan is somebody that I first connected with almost eight years ago at the launch of his first book, Soccer Tough. And I was going back through our Twitter chat, Dan. And it's incredible to see your journey and um, how prominent a role is that, that you now play. And um, we are genuinely so grateful for you for being willing to share the time with us today and uh, look forward to obviously diving into this conversation about how we can educate coaches on how they can support players in, in creating their game face. So Dan, thank you. Willow, thank you. Um, we're gonna look forward to this one. Again, for anybody who is just on the line, Please feel free to drop in on the, the chat icon with any questions that you have for Dan throughout this. We'll try and, and get to that after uh, me and Mark go through a number of the questions that we have for him. So um, thanks for being here. Okay. Um, yeah, so Dan, I opened, uh, I opened yesterday with this and I'm going to ask you the same thing. If you can, talking about a process where we can inspire and come together, I want to give a shout out to the people that um, perhaps have inspired you and, and you believe are top of their trade. So if you can give me your all-time, all-star, five-a-side team of coaches that you've seen work, interact with, and, and develop players, who would they be and, and why are they on that list? Um, okay, I was thinking about this and I thought it might be fun to um, actually um, mention people from the... Uh, professional elite level that I've worked with coaches I've worked with I'm not I'm absolutely not saying they're the best ones they've certainly inspired me in different ways and and been there on my journey but it actually comprises quite a good five-a-side team so um, <laughs> um, so let, let's start at the beginning uh, and this is a little bit off the top of my head um, uh, a guy called Wayne Burnett who really gave me my first chance in football around about 2005 something like that um and he's now under 21s under 23s coach at um spurs um i joined him at a club called fisher athletic that eventually went bust uh, not because of his work or my work hopefully but um it did go bust um and that was in the sixth i worked with him in the sixth division um of English football, it was basically Blue Square South, and I got in, when I got involved with soccer, I was like, I've got to learn the language and got to learn the specific challenges that players face. That was so important uh, for me, and he was a real strong mentor at that point. I mean, he had never he'd been at Blackburn Rovers under Kenny Dalglish in the 90s, didn't make it there, and played lower league football. Um, here in England but he was a really good manager and he wanted to play a certain style and we played in a division with an average age uh, the average age of the division was 28 uh, you'd appreciate this Willow and then uh, we had an average age of 21 he brought in lots of young players for, down from Leighton Orient Academy Arsenal Academy etc etc and played football the right way whatever that means controversial point I suppose he played it on the on the ground and played it out the back and we did really well we got into the playoffs and it was awesome he's a really great guy and he deserves everything uh, that he gets he's now at Spurs doing really really well um, the second person I suppose would be stunningly name droppery here but uh, when I was doing stuff at West Ham over a decade ago Jan Frank Cozola became uh, the manager and he's there just because he was basically when you used to watch training he used to join in 
and um, he was uh, about 40 yeah. years old then, and he was still the best player on the pitch. Yeah. Um, so he just gets in the side. He was a very good manager as well, doing a very good coach, amazing ideas that he brought over from Parma. And he was just, an, obviously, he was an inspiration for players. You know, who's not going to be inspired by Gianfranco Zola talking about how he used to practice free kicks for a couple of hours after training with Maradona at Napoli? I mean, you're just like, really? Can I, can I tell you anything here of any value whatsoever? So, so we're going Wayne Burnett, we're going Gianfranco Zola. Um, um, let's think. Uh, I I loved uh, Steve McLaren's energy. Uh, I mean, Willow, you you know Steve McLaren very well. And when I was at Derby County, I just thought he was awesome uh, with his energy on the pitch, in training. He comes alive. Um, lovely, lovely guy. Good coach. Um, so I'm going to go for him. I need someone sturdy at centre back. So I'm going to go for Nigel Pearson, who he'll just smash everybody off the pitch on a five side. So and he'll bully them. So I'm going to go for Nigel, who I I only had the pleasure of working with him for a few months, um, but I really liked his style. Um, and at the back. Uh, I've got to have a goalkeeper and it's the goalkeeping coach I work closely with now, um, Ant White, Anthony White, who uh, he's at Bournemouth. Um, we've got two sensational goalkeepers at Bournemouth, Aaron Ramsdale, who will be in, in England number one, and Mark Travers, who will be Ireland number one. Um, and they're very close now, both of them. And Ant is awesome and as open-minded as a coach as I've ever uh, come across. So look, I've got the, uh, I don't know, how can you say it? I've got the skillful uh, player, uh, at the insp who's the inspiration. I've got the guy who goes around smashing everybody. I've got the open-minded coach who knows about ecological dynamics bonus. Um, I've got uh, Wayne, who was just generally awesome. Who else have I got? Did I? Am I still missing somebody? I think Wayne. We've got the Go ahead, Willa. Goalkeeper coach. No, I've got goalkeeper. That's Ant White. Wayne, anyway. Zola, McLaren, Pearson and Ant White. McLaren, that's it. There you go. There's there's, there's my five. Um, so I thought I'd do something different and do it f from a different stance. Does that work? Is that okay? That works for me, but that definitely works for me. And, and for the viewers, for the listeners, um, what I hope that also does is provide a little bit of an insight into Dan's history and, and the people that he's been able to work alongside and, and support. So Again, just quite why we're, we're so excited about diving in further to this chat. So, Dan, thank you. Um, I'm going to get started now with some of the more formal questions and we'll, we'll dive into uh, we'll dive into learning a little bit about your, this, obviously, the psychological background that, that you bring here. So, um, you've said before, Dan, that, that you find it, frankly, astonishing that coaches leave the development of the players' psychosocial skills the chance. Um, before we get into the details of developing a game face, why is it that you feel so strongly about that? And and what message can you provide everybody that's listening to the importance of um, that area of a player's makeup and development? I think I think it re it's, it's really important to clarify, given that we've got 75 coaches online, that um, I, I, I'm trying not to be too hard on coaches. And I, I actually think First and foremost, it's our fault. Uh, and when I say our fault, it's it's sports psychologists, maybe. Um, we need to be better. Um, at, see, someone's left already after you said that, Tom. They're just like, I'm not having that. Someone's just gone, gone basically. Just like, I'm not having that. He can't, this psychologist can't tell us this. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I think we in psychology uh, haven't, been good enough I, I think as I always say I think sometimes we're if there's a continuum here sometimes we're, we you know we've been a bit too hey he's back that's great he's a bit too far we're either a bit too far over let's say on the right hand side where we, uh, we we're too scientific and we start talking about systematic desensitization and inverted U hypothesis and everybody's like well what is that or how can I use that and then on the left hand side we're a little bit punch the air a bit fluffy you can achieve any thing and we need to continue to get better at hitting the middle ground you know whereby you know we we look at evidence-based and when i say evidence-based i'm talking about empirical work so scientific having scientific 
validity, um, good ex expect what we would call experiential evidence. So, so good evidence from coaching practice and coaching practice utilizing psychology. And at the same time, we've got to be good personalities um, in, um, in, in our work. You know, we've got to be able to get our stuff across. We've got to be able to um, deliver it in, in a way that uh, people get um, excited by it and they feel that they can use it. Uh, practical tools, as we'll talk about today, practical philosophies, uh, things that actually interest and engage things maybe in the, in the language of, of football, in the language of soccer. I think that's really important. So look, please, Tom, first thing to say is, you know, I'm not blaming coaches at all. What I would like to do and what I'm trying to do in my career is get, uh, get coaches, I think it's two things, more passionate about this area. I think we are in every single sport. I mean, when I was a pro golfer and I was coaching the game, what do you do? The first thing you do is you immediately go towards technique. You work on somebody's technique. To, you you, you, you uh, find faults in their swing and that you help them from a swing perspective. So you immediately go to technique. I think we're very socialized in the coaching world in every sport to uh, go immediately into tech tack. That's almost how we define coaching by default, technical and tactical work. Uh, so I, I, I think that um, it's almost a natural phenomenon uh, within humanity, within co the coaching world, to just go straight into that. I think the, the um, so, so, so I think there's that. And I, I, I think the other thing to say is that we, uh, you know, what's really off-putting is you see everybody leaving as we're talking here, and I'm thinking, my God, what am I saying? I've got, I've got to sharpen up. Here. Well, so okay. it's, it's, it's throwing me completely. And now I know what it's like to be a footballer on the pitch with lots of distractions coming at me. Game face, so, come on, game face. So thank you. So, so look, I, I think that the other thing is that we need to be able to create applicable models that you guys can take hold of and use, get excited about using um, on your day-to-day -day training pitch and on your match day pitch. Um, and that's what's missing. So I don't really blame coaches. I think we need to do a better job. I think that psychosocial isn't something that everybody is oriented to when they start coaching. I think and that's the other thing I was going to say is that because it's less tangible, it's just a mess. It's chaos. And it's very, very difficult on coaching courses to be able to uh, help condense the information and help coaches have specific frameworks. It feels like a mishmash of everything. Does that make sense? So in summary, three things. Psychs need to do it better. We need to accept in coaching that we're kind of conditioned into tech tack. And it's kind of a little bit all over the place. And so we need to build better models for you guys to go, yeah, OK, I get that. I can use that. Brilliant. Let's go do it. Got there in the end, Tom. Got there in the end, mate. Well done. And um, yeah, so, Tom. Yeah, I, I, I think about um... I'm going to be subjective because I'm I'm thinking about my own growth and development outside of that privileged professional bubble where you have your game face on. Sometimes you're, you're, you're acting or playing up to a stereotype and sometimes you don't feel like you. And then you come outside of that bubble. And when I came out of that bubble in 2013, um, I was lost a little bit for a while. So I think about gro my growth and development um, moving into the coaching world, leaving the UK, coming to the US. Um, and feeling like I, I needed to protect myself. So instead of actually asking for help, instead of showing a little bit of vulnerability, um, instead of being humble enough to say, actually, I, I don't quite know how to do this, um, and, and trying to seek somebody to support that, um, that lack of knowledge I had or um, just to help me in general, um, I boxed off, I closed myself off. So I would read certain articles and I would go and find things online, but there's nothing quite like that, that human connection when you're speaking to somebody who actually understand the depth and the layers of, of emotional responses and protecting yourself psychologically, that psychological safe space you talk about. Um, it, it's quite a journey. 
right? And and if you if you go off on your own and you think you can self-educate, which is possible, um, you'll you'll only get so far. So, in that sense, Dan, how what advice would you give to coaches um, who are being who who naturally are protective over what they know and what they don't know? Um, how how do you try and unlock that? And what um, what processes would you suggest to start exploring? Um, that self-awareness, that self-reflectiveness that can bring about growth and development. You use the term self-awareness, um, and I think that's really interesting. And I, and I almost think that that's your entry point when it comes to the psychological stuff. It's it's your self skills. And certainly in my psychosocial model of coaching, um, I, I talk about self skills being your entry point. Uh, and when I say self skills, I, I by that I mean self-awareness, self-management, self-reflection. Um, I think those are rarely spoken about, but possibly lie at the heart of coaching, self-awareness, self-management, self-reflection. And I urge uh, every coach um, to uh, engage in self-reflection every single day. I mean, I think obviously the coaches online here um, have started that process and will do that process uh, uh, often. And um, no doubt media helps as well, um, the spreading of ideas. But I would urge every single coach to engage in self-reflection every day, to work out what their areas of strengths are, to work out what they feel that they need to improve. Um, I would uh, urge any coach to, to build the, their self-awareness, uh, the objectives they have in their coaching, the values that they have. Um, I think that that's absolutely vital. Um, and. I think that what I'd say, Willow, is this. I would start with a blank piece of paper. You know what I'm a fan of? I'm a fan of structures and frameworks. And I think structure has become a bit of a dirty word, especially in soccer, uh, because I think that it's a very, it's a game of adaptability. It's a game uh, that's very organic, that's changing all the time. But I think if you can sit down with a pen and a bit of paper and you can start to write out what you think the psychosocial box looks like for you, that's, that's what I just start. Just write things down. Come up with terms, leadership, teamship, relationship, self skills. Uh, coaching practice, motivation, uh, mental skills, as in confidence, commitment, come up with as many terms as possible and just branch off of those terms. Um, things that you are interested in engaging, ways that you deal, that you help players with relation to those things. So motivation, what do you do? What do you do right now? What do you have your players do? How do you help uh, in, increase motivation or improve or build motivation? How do you help players build their own motivation? And then what theories are there out there for motivation? You know, um, and I think you can do that with everything that you write down. Same with leadership, same with teamship, same with relationship. So coach athlete relationship. I interviewed for the Sports Psych Show, the world's leading expert in this area, Professor Sophia Jarrett from Loughborough University. Um, teamship, um, what theories are there around that? So I think get a bit of paper, get a pen. At the top of that, write psych, psych social or psychosocial. Write down all the words that you can. And then coming off of those words, how do you, what do you know now? How do you like to go about um, those? A framework to your psychosocial box there. 
And in my opinion, the psychosocial drives the technical, tactical, physical, that drives participation, progression, performance in that order. That's not saying psychosocial is more important. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is at the forefront of your mind when you sit down and you write your coaching sessions, when you write your session designs, your activities, at the forefront of your mind should be psychosocial because psychosocial is omnipresent. It's always happening. It's always there. So having a framework or structure to this is imperative, but you've got to start that process. People don't start it, Willow, and that's the problem. So lay, lay yourself bare in your own private time, mm -hmm. on your own private desk. You don't have to do it with other people. You can just write some stuff down. What do I know now? That starts your framework and then build from there. I like that. I like that, Dan. I think you, just on a basic principle that every action, before every action, there's a thought that precedes it. Of course, psych social, it, it sounds very simple in principle, right? There's a thought before every action. So if we don't start with the psych social piece um, and we start with the tech tactical piece, um, the chances of being accurate and getting it right um, are diminished, I think. Well, uh, if I can also come back at you there, Willow, and I know, Tom, we want to get on to Game Face, and we will, I'm sure, but <laughs> there's a feeling uh more there's a feeling before a lot of thoughts there's a or every thought and there's a feeling before every action yeah. um and that's what we know and we've known that for the last two decades and there's a there's a neuroscientist at new york university called joseph ledoux mm -hmm. who when he, he he discovered this in rats in 1999 is a quick pathway to the brain so sensory information comes in filters into your body goes through a relay station um, uh, called the thalamus in the middle part of your brain. And then that sen sends information in two directions. It sends it to the amygdala, first of all. That's your fear area. OK, and that's why you feel you can feel fear in an instant. We have to. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived as human beings. Uh, thought follows feeling. Feeling is first. So um, let me articulate that with what you're saying you cannot get past psychosocial it is impossible we are social cr creatures the whole of personality theory is based on the notion we have a personality and we are in survival mode because we're trying to get along and get ahead so whenever any so let's put this in with reference to soccer all of think of all of your players they arrive at training and their unconscious driver is to get along and to get ahead, to get along with their peers and to get ahead of in their peers, especially when you add the competitive environment in there. So you cannot take social out of any single second um, in training in on match day, you know, and you can't take it out of things before your training sessions and after your training sessions you know because players are judging you before they've even arrived you know they're thinking hey i've got training today with coach x and this is what i think about coach x and this is what i think of all my teammates and this is what i think of what i'm probably going to face today you know and this is how i'm going to co cope with it and then they carry your training sessions with you home they carry your training sessions with them home. Um, it's in their mind. It rifles through their body. They're thinking and feeling it all the time. So that's why it's so important to get session design right. And that's why at the forefront of coaching is participation. I would say it's not professional performance. It's actually participation. It's engaging players at every single level. Jurgen Klopp has to engage players. Jose Mourinho has to engage players. Um, an under eight coach has to engage players. An under six coach has to engage players. Why? Because your players are constantly judging themselves, you, and everything around them. And you, you want to be able to engage them. So psychosocial is happening all the time. Yeah. And Dan, I, firstly, thank you for the depth of, of those answers. And, and Willow, to blend kind of the, the, what, you, what you were suggesting with where I wanted to go next. Dan, that the background that you possess is bringing together a world that was previously somewhat disconnected, right? You, you now 
psychology used to sit somewhat of an island and and now it's becoming it, it's widely accepted as being you know more inherent in, in our everyday lives because of the influence and value that you've just you know eloquently explained um i think to give a shout out to everybody on the line when you listen to dan speak and you can better understand the importance of it then it it provides it provides almost a motivation to go and want to be better which obviously clearly people are doing now but the accessibility to that information from people like yourself who are at the top of the tree becomes super critical so um I think blending in now into the concept of, of how you support your players and developing a game face, you know, what is a game face and what they can go through. Um, these kind of step by step guides that, that you're in a position where you can share, I think really helps shift the needle in the direction, as Willow said, of, of not being left on that island, not not feeling vulnerable, not feeling lost. Yeah, I, what, yeah, what, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, what, well, really well said, and I'm not too sure if I'm doing a deep dive or just rambling on, but um, I, I think that, so a game face is uh, my number one tool, and I'm sure everybody online has either heard me uh, ramble on about it a bit on other podcasts or, or um, um, on, on Twitter, but I'm passionate that a coach is in a position to be a far more powerful psychologist than me. Why? Because you've got your, your you're on the grass, you know, you're, you're in your cleats, you're in your boots and you're, you're on the grass. And that's the number one position to help players psychologically. And you talk about isolation. I mean, I'm passionate about the integration of, of this stuff. So let's really simplify it. You know, a game face um, is the personality you want to be on the pitch. It's the attitude you want to portray. Think about your player's personality on the pitch. Think about their attitude. Um, it's your optimal uh, mindset. It optimizes your physicality. Um, it is powerful. It works I was going to say from eight to 80 year olds, but I'd like to think six to 80 year olds because you can simplify it massively. You can make it complex. I'll give you an example from the world of elite adult sport, relentless and dominant, relentless and dominant. And this is how simple this is. Relentless and dominant, relentless and dominant. So a player um, I, I work with who played in the Champions League final uh, last season, and I'm saying this not to impress you, but to impress upon you, um, uh, played in the Champions League final last season, went in with one major objective, and it wasn't to win the Champions League. Of course, he wanted to win, but that wasn't his proactive objective. It wasn't to high perform. Of course, he wanted to high perform. Of course, he wanted an eight or nine out of 10 game, uh, but he was worked on being and work is the what the right term here he worked uh, on being more relaxed about his performance he he knows what an eight out of ten performance looks like for him but he also knows that he can't force that that's an important thing to say you cannot force your performance and at all levels this is where players often become unstuck particularly young ambitious players is they try too hard to force their performance and one of the processes, one of the tasks he had was his game face, which was relentless and dominant, relentless and dominant. And his narrative going into the game was my job on the pitch is to be relentless and dominant. My job on the pitch is to be relentless and dominant. I'm going to be relentless and dominant nonstop and nothing and no one takes me away from relentless and dominant. Nothing and no one takes me away from relentless and dominant. I'm going to be relentless and dominant with every run, every movement, every action, every pass, every challenge, every cross, everything I do, I'm going to be relentless and dominant and nothing and no one takes that, takes that away from me. And nothing and no one is going to take me away from that game face. That was his game face, relentless and dominant. And that became his narrative Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because your players, everybody online here has to understand that your players have an, a narrative, an inner narrative, a, an inner story, a way, a, a way they speak to themselves about their upcoming games. For instance, yes, their upcoming training sessions, but their upcoming games. So, so it's really, really important that you know this. And what a game face does is it manages that narrative. It simplifies that narratives. It breaks down 
responsibilities within somebody's role into a couple of words, into a couple of words that broaden out, that branch out into, as I say, a whole bunch of responsibilities. So this player went in relentless and dominant, relentless and dominant, relentless and dominant. And he had that mantra and that was his main objective there's a player i work with who plays international football and his game face he's a striker and he's striving to be um confident relentless lion relentless seems to be a common word but confident relentless lion confident relentless lion there's another player i work with who is df busquets dominant focus busquets dominant focus busquets there's another player i work with who's mates football effort and energy mates football effort and energy mates football because this player is the premier league player but this player knows he's too much of a perfectionist too much of a perfectionist too striving too hard to high perform and when we sat down and we spoke and he said dan i i you know when we talk about me at my best which we'll come on to in a second when we talk about me at my best i think about i think about playing in the playground when i was a kid at school i just played mates football and he married that up with effort and energy so sorry. mates football. sorry go on I, I think that that insight is is wonderful, and and the question that I want to ask now is 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 give us and give the listeners an example of the questions that you ask to get those responses, because I think that's the that's the blend of of trying to find okay how how do you go about figuring this out because that sounds really simple. Okay, I love the way you stopped me in my chat. So pretty good good questioning. It's just like Dan, stop rambling on. Just get to the main point here. Um, okay, so three questions, three questions you need to ask. Okay, and they're all as important as each other. Maybe historically, I found the second one less important, but let's go with it. As a psychologist, and this is the same for you, everybody here um, listening, you've got three major tools in your toolbox, in my opinion. Other sites would say something different, and that's fine. Uh, memory, imagination, perception. When I wrote Soccer Tough, um, I talked about memory, imagination, perception, memory, imagination, perception, memory, imagination, perception, memory. Tell me about you at your best. What does your best game look like? You're tapping into somebody's memory. You've always got to remember as a coach, when you're asking questions, you're asking somebody to dive into, to create pictures in their mind, to sum up certain feelings that will rifle through their body. Tell me about you at your best. Tell me about your best game. Tell me about your best game. What does that look like? What does that feel like? What do others see when you're playing your best? Try to extract as much information as you can from that player. Second question, tell me, tell me about a dream game. That's imagination. That's not memory. That's not a game that's happened. Tell me about a dream game. Uh, imagination, a 10 out of 10 game. Let's, let's have some fun here. Let's play with some images, some pictures, a dream game. Um, and then um, a, a third one, perception. Who do you want to be on the pitch? Who do you want to be on the pitch? That's perception. And that can take you in, in different directions. And we can talk about that. That's going to take you in different directions. But if you go back to the relentless and dominant person, relentless and dominant is tell me about you at your best. Dan, and it, don't get me wrong, there was more conversation here. But in the end, it was I'm relentless and dominant. Right. You know, I, I'm relentless and, and, and it's and it's helping players. So, so what you want to try and do is extract some key words, some action based words from players. That's so important. Action based words, action based words. And I, OK, and, not, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but, but process as well. Right. None of those are, are outcome. Right. That's that's all an emphasis. And, and you obviously speak about controlling the controllables and, you know, why why is that important as well so it's action and process absolutely so in that questioning in the questioning process you you want to help that player scaffold down the information they're providing for you as best you can because where they'll start their entry point will be well uh, in my best game i scored a hat trick and i set up a goal and um i played really well and everyone players said i played great and i I go on some long mazy runs and stuff like that. So they'll give you some KPIs, key performance yeah. indicators, I would call those, and some outcomes. Oh, and we won as well, you know, that kind of thing. You need to scale. Well, tell me what that looks Tell me more there. 
you know, if I was watching you, what would I actually see? Tell me about your body language. You know, um, tell me about the runs you made. You know, what were you what were you experiencing at the time? You know, tell me a bit more. Try to extract scaffolded detail from the players so you can scaffold it down to specific things so I'll get you know, so you know it might be as a striker it might be somebody going well yeah I, I so your confident relentless lion said to me well when I'm at my best I'm attacking the six yard area really really aggressively yeah. you know or relentlessly I'm really attacking that six yard area relentlessly you know and the gaffer wants me to do that as well and when I think about it you know when I'm at my best I'm, I look confident and then I might ask that player well what does confident look like and that player might go and I'm trying to get the specifics the de detail when I'm tall and I look athletic and okay you look athletic right bingo athletic might be one of those so we're trying to get it down to the lowest sort of denominators, if you like, um, to get those key action based words. And that's a skill. It's just asking, asking the questions that scaffold down, scaffold down, scaffold down, scaffold down um, to get those key words. So and, hmm. Mr. Michael Supp, for many of you who, who don't know, is also a co-founder of Beyond Force. And he's just popped up on the chat with it with an interesting question for you, Dan. Um, suggesting that obviously a lot of these wonderful examples are perhaps with adults and, and more elite players have you done this exercise with children or are there any recommendations that you would make for working with players um at, across the youth level for for something similar uh it's a really really good question so at the moment on the dan abraham soccer academy we have several thousand young players um on there all of whom uh, are creating game faces um college programs who who create game faces and it's exactly the same process and the great thing about this is um you can help a, an, an eight-year-old come out with positive messy um or upbeat um upbeat neuer if it's a goalkeeper you know some of these younger players know more more players than i certainly do and they tend to come out with players that they want to be etc and what you can do as a coach is you can also suggest action-based words so you can prompt by saying hey you know what when i watch you play you look really happy and positive you know you look like you're having fun when i look when i see you play at your best you know um maybe we can make this uh, happy and positive this game face is happy and positive what i'd like you to do is show me happy and positive today I don't care if you misplace a pass. I don't care if you miss a chance to score. I just want you to show me happy and positive. And we're going to base the training session around that. You can make this as simple as you like. You can suggest words. You can co-create words with players. You can elicit words from players. And that's why it works so well with younger uh, uh, age uh, players. Uh, they tend to have great creativity and imagination. So they tend to come up with um, things that really work well for them um so absolutely it works across across all ages Stan, can I, can I jump in and ask a question here on um when i think about creating a game face uh, it might be different to having a, a, a creating a persona so there's a danger and this is why i think um it needs experts in the field to work with children and coaches to understand um some of the pitfalls that you can have in terms of trying to be somebody else or having characteristics of somebody else. So for instance, if you were Zlatan Ibrahimovic or you were, you were basing your game around him, I would say there are some positives and negatives, um, certainly for an eight, nine or 10 year old to onboard as a game face. Um, because sometimes your game face isn't actually who you really are. Mm -hmm. I would have said I was I was naturally aggressive on the soccer field, but I wasn't an aggressive person off the soccer field. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you would bring balance and understanding to this is you on the field and this is your game face. And this is how you um, can understand the difference between good behavior and negative behavior that sometimes you might see off the field from a professional athlete as well. Yeah, and and I think as a, as an aside, but also related, I think this is where I suppose several things to say. I think this is where the third question is really really uh, empowering. Who do you want to be on the pitch? 
um, and actually asking that question. I mean, you quite rightly said there, Willow, and, and I, I come across this every day. Um, um, if you ask that question, you can get into the mind of a young player who is watching, probably watching quite a lot of soccer, probably has in their mind that they, they let's say they want to be Ibrahimovic. And if we narrow that down to Ibra, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I want to be Ibrahimovic. And that coach, let's say it's an under 12s, under 13s, under 14s uh, side, whereby it's still formative, but things are starting to become put it set in place. Um, and that coach might think, well, you know, Ibrahimovic is the wrong kind of player here because of the way this player plays, this young player plays, or what this player needs. And so that's where it becomes a, a co-creation between coach and player. And that also has a great knock-on effect between coach-athlete relationship as well. These are great conversations to have. I mean, do coaches actually stop to ask what these players have in their mind in terms of who they want to be. My experience at under 21 level is sometimes you've got young players. I mean, we had it at AFC Bournemouth um, last season where a young player at under 21 level was obsessed with Neymar, obsessed with Neymar, but the coaches want him to, wanted him to really simplify his game. Um, and I don't know what those coaching points were, but they wanted him to simplify his game um and this player had a schematic as we'd call it in psychology about Neymar 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 this is what Neymar does you know I can get to this level I can get to this level and it was actually a hindrance for him and actually just this came out when we started to work on a game face when we actually started to work on a game face so I, I think working on a game face can actually instigate these kind of conversations what's the schematic of the young player you've got in front of you who do they think they 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 are who they can be, who they're trying to be. And if they come up with a player who's completely dissimilar to how you feel, because coaching can still, you can still utilize your expertise, who you feel that player can be, that's a useful process to go through. So who do you want to be on the pitch? Can You can derive a lot of good information from that. Um, Dan, how, give me, give me some more actionable steps. So you've got, uh, an audience full of youth, collegiate, maybe some professional coaches, what day-to-day -day interactions, what week-to-week, -week, what, you know, pre-match, like what interactions and how intentional should these interactions be for the, for the coaches on the line, for how they can continue to develop, monitor, support, revisit with their players, you know, the, this conversation, what, what would you recommend there? Like how frequently should, should these conversations happen? I'll start answering that question by linking it to Willow's uh, question because I didn't fully answer Willie, Willow's question. And I think it's an important point, uh, this notion of behavior and personality and differentiating uh, your on-pitch persona and your off-pitch persona. And don't get me wrong, I get there are always going to be people, players, who can naturally get into a certain persona on the pitch and that suits them. I think a game face is a balance between authenticity and inauthenticity. I think that that's really important to say. And, and within my dialogue with any player, sometimes um, a, a player will create a game face that is completely authentic to that person. Uh, Willow could tell me better uh, than I'd know, but I would hazard a guess that Roy Keane would be such a player. Maybe, maybe. Um, but uh, I think Willow makes a great point. And, and, uh, and uh, again, I'm going to fuse these two questions together by saying, um, I, for me, a game face requires reinforcement. I'm not saying that you stand by the side of the pitch and constantly bark game face, game face, game face. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, for instance, and, and uh, what I am saying is we're doing a rondo, we're doing a keep ball, we're doing a small sided game, we're doing a passing activity, whatever we're doing, can I see that in the style of your game face? Can yeah. I see that in the style of your game face? Let me tell your audience now, you are immediately mentally training just by making that point. Show me your game face, show me your game face in, that acti in this activity. And because every single player will have a different game face, you're hitting a team, you're hitting a group, and you're hitting individuals. That's important to say. 
show yeah. me your game face show me your game face so if somebody's got cool calm van dyke and another center back has got upbeat strong terry of which i have two center backs who have that and they're in in their teams um and one is authentic to that person and one is quite inauthentic to that person because they need it that way uh, and that's been derived from from co-creation with coaches then when they hear game face they think cool calm van dyke when they hear game face, they think, I don't know what it was, positive upbeat Terry or whatever it was. They immediately think of those pictures, those sensations, what it's like to live in your body when you're on the pitch. Now, come back to Willow's point. You're quite right, Willow. What, what we're not saying is be like this all the time. When you and a game face is the embodied and embedded, per, embodied and embedded personality you want to have on the pitch. Um, and you can soft start that in a soft way with young players and you can turn up the volume of your insistence as they get older. If you've got somebody who's 16 years plus and we're getting into that real competitive realm, I want to see your game face. I want to see your game face. And you can get coming back to your question, Tom, get your leaders involved, get your teammates involved, your two centre backs. If they know each other's game face, come on, want to see your game face. Let's let's both be in our game face here. Let's have all, all four, four defenders in our game face. That's absolutely crucial. Teamship, relationship, leadership, mental skills. It's all thrown in. You're on the side. You, your assistant coaches, if you've got that luxury, your assistant coaches are going in. Game face. Didn't think I saw your game face there. Felt you come away from it there. When you take your boots off, then you, then you, then you Joe blogs. Then, then, you, then you come back into who you are. But when you put your boots on, maybe that's when we, or maybe that, you know, that this is the decision you can make as a coach. Maybe it's in the changing room when we put our boots on. Now we're, now we're, when we're, maybe it's when we're coming out from the changing room. Maybe it, when it's walking out onto the pitch. Maybe it's when we start to warm up. Maybe that's too early. Maybe it's that first activity. You know, bang, we're into our game face. This is what we do here. This is how we go about our business in this team. Now, that would be the kind of narrative at the competitive end. Yeah. The narrative at the at the uh, participative end is much more relaxed. It's much more light. It's having fun around positive messy. You know, it's having fun around uh, nonstop bappy. You know, it's just having fun with it. But you're very softly, very gently introducing eight, nine, 10 year olds into little words little actions that they can start to just self-regulate just very very and if they don't they don't so what doesn't matter they're nine years old nobody cares right so, dan i think that's that's fascinating and um just i'm going to put my my coaching and my doc hat on for a minute and ask a, a couple of questions should should players on the team know each other's game face you obviously referenced maybe that pairings could you know how important is that and and if that is important at what age and then secondly a lot of the the u.s soccer um courses in this country now are suggesting when you lead leading the player is a portion of a coach's role so um the ability to build out individual development plans etc cetera, etc cetera. how how important and what place should uh, you know a game face and the development of a game face have in a in an IDP? So, two questions that just sprung out. I don't know if you can if you mm. can elaborate more because I think that that's the practical stuff that will be fascinating. They're great questions. I um, I dream when I work with a, a Premier League club who wants me to do game faces across the board and gives me the psychological and them the psychological safety to do that. And then the next step up from that uh, is the psychological safety of everybody sharing their game face. Yeah. Uh, and that to me excites me so much. That to me is where a sports psychology psychologists can be integrated into the process, um, have small group meetings uh, and empower coaches to drive this because you're the experts on on soccer, on football, not me, but empower uh, coaches to drive this. Wow, everybody is invested in that. Don't get me wrong, game face isn't the only technique here, but it is a, it is a central technique. Everybody's invested in that. 
everybody's invested in that. All your players are invested in that. All your players know each other's game face. Wow. And there'd be some mockery, and I, and, I, and I get that, and I understand that. And maybe in your coaching environment, that's a goal, isn't it? It's an objective to get to a point where they can share yeah. uh, each other's game faces. But even if we just share the term, but that's what's happening. That's what's happening at my soccer academy with uh, a dozen or so college programs is they're sharing game faces, and that's creating great teamship, leadership, relationship, mental skill, great coaching practice, psychologically informed environments, great self skills, great motivation. So, yes, it can be done. What you're talking about is, is the, the absolute um, uh, epitome of what we want. Let's see if we can do that. Um, in terms of how important with it is it, look, we're sitting here, you're getting Dan Abraham's colloquialisms. You know, the game face is my colloquialism. Um, it's not to say this is a pictorial metaphor. It's not to say other sports psychologists haven't created pictorial metaphors. Of course they have. Coaches will have done that. They do it all the time. You guys paint pictures all the time, right? Um, I'm I'm putting it more, pro uh, uh, making it more predominant. Um, I think that I think it would be wrong of me to say, hey, everybody's got to do this and this should be at the forefront of coaching, coaching plans. What I would say has to be at the forefront of coaching courses is psych social. That's yeah. what I'd say, because but, I think that that's that's the tough stuff. That's the hard stuff. Right. But this is a great uh, again, we, we kind of started with, with barriers to how people might, you know, barriers to entry for why people might not emphasize sports psych and, and psych social stuff enough. Because I think it it's people don't necessarily know the ideas or know why they want it, the value of the why behind it. I think this is a great example of look, having these conversations doesn't sound super complicated. It just sounds like you have to be intentional about it and then be willing to reinforce it and be willing to revisit it. So if you can link it to IDPs, if you can have that, you know, that commentary and that challenge at the start of a practice session or in your team talk prior to a game and, and it is becoming part of your culture then you know that ability to integrate a broader concept is it's just part of coaching right like that's look it's it's asking the question and, and again when i say this i i'm probably going 16 plus i'm going more towards the competitive end but what 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 are the, what's the framework what's the mental skills framework of your players you know willow i've never in my 15 years working with players i've never sat there and had a player go dan you know, when I've asked them, what are you trying to achieve mentally? No one has ever said, Dan, I'm trying to do ABC, ABC. Mm. There's been some vague stuff. Don't get me wrong. There's been some vague stuff, but I've never had Dan, I'm trying ABC, you know, and, 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 and whether it's through the academy, whether it's through my, my, my private work with my clients, I want them to go. I'm trying to be in my game face, squash my ants, stick to my script, execute my controllers, which are some other techniques, right? whether it's you, you use my colloquialisms, colloquialisms or somebody else's, it's like, what, what's the framework? And now the reason why we need to have a framework and why you need to put psychosocial at the forefront, forefront from a competitive perspective, let's forget about all the other stuff in your coaching environment, but from, from a competitive perspective is this. There's nothing more powerful on the pitch than your brain and your nervous system. There is nothing more powerful on the pitch than your brain and nervous system. Your brain and nervous system will beat you before your opponents beat you. Your brain and nervous system will beat you before your opponents beat you. So you need to have things that keep your brain and nervous system engaged. OK, the game is complex. You've got billions of decisions to make. You've got loads of information floating around at any given time. You are going to be distracted at times. Emotion will overwhelm you at times. OK, you will suffer from a confidence, a drop in confidence. Anxiety happens to you. Low mood happens to you. We talk, to, talk about controlling your attitude, effort and energy. You know, anxiety will happen to you. It happens to you. A drop of confidence happens to you. Low mood happens to you. These things happen to you and they're happening to you to you often as you compete. That's why you need a framework. That's why great word, Tom, intentional. Players need to be, especially at the competitive level, especially at the, you need to be intentional with your um, framework. If you're not, I'm not saying you can't get away with it. And there are clearly players on this planet who have so much skill in their boots that they get away with it. There's no doubts about that. But there's often players on the pitch who hide, who play slightly less well than they should do at times, uh, who are 
slightly slower to anticipate, who play with tunnel vision at times, don't see the 360 degree view at times, who are slightly weaker in a challenge at times because they don't have a mental skills framework. And if they had those mental techniques within a mental skills framework, that would help them. That would help them massively, in my yeah. humble opinion. Dan, can I just want to kind of bookend this a little bit? You, you mentioned emotion before being a key or, or the, the key kind of filter as as before we have any thought and take any action is an emotion to, to be felt first. And um, when you were saying dominant and relentless, dominant and relentless, and you were saying it over and over again, it brought back a, an actual emotion in me, a feeling um, from being on the field. And it, it makes me understand and realize the, the value of um reinforcing how something feels um and and that's the that's the entry point i almost feel like that's the gateway question how does it feel and it, even if you ask it over and over again it reinforces the feeling attached to the action and the thought would that be fair to say Awesome. And, and you know what? Uh, and this is where I mean, I, I spoke to uh, the sports scientist Steve Magnus recently about this great sports scientist um, and running coach. And because he's written a great article worth reading it on power poses. And, you know, a lot of people would just Google power poses and the work of Amy Cuddy. Uh, and scientifically, it's had a lot of uh, backlash over the last year or so. And um, but but um, the point of power pose is how you hold your body, how you hold your body matters because how you hold your body uh, influences the hormones you release. So you release testosterone when you hold yourself in a powerful position. Think dominant, relentless, dominant, relentless. Think, Willow, about when you were on the pitch there at Old Trafford, how you were running, how you were moving, and when you were doing that really well. Dominant, relentless, dominant, relentless, dominant, relentless. At that time, you were releasing. What we, what we can strongly hypothesize is you were releasing testosterone, okay? And, and, and that is your hormonal forerunner to high performance. Um, and so and, and so what that does is it gives you feelings of power, feelings of strength, feel strength, feelings of energy, you know, and that is so important. Feeling is such an important thing in every single sport, every sport, even in golf. You walk onto the tee you, at times you felt like oh, this. I'm. I, I, my swing feels good. I feel it. I'm feeling this here. If I could get back in a time machine, I'd be tall, dominant Kepka, tall, dominant Kepka, tall, dominant Kepka. Why? Because I walked onto the first tee and I was like, his swing's really good. This hole's so hard. I'm never going to shoot a great score. This weather's terrible. I had all these ants, automatic negative thoughts that I had to squash. I'd walk onto that tee, tall, dominant Kepka. That player walks out relentless and dominant thinks relentless and dominant another player uh, sharp upbeat terry sharp upbeat terry another player confident relentless lion that's so so important because you you say it you feel it you feel it it drives your behaviors it doesn't guarantee an eight out of ten performance it doesn't guarantee a nine out of ten performance but what it does do is it optimizes your performance and i'm fascinated willow Tom, I'm fascinated with the notion of can we turn the fours into sixes, the fives into sixes, the fives into seven out of tens, the six into seven out of tens. That's what I say to my players. Let's let's have a have a floor of six out of ten. Let's be six out of ten or better. How? When we're not there, when we are low mood, when we feel flat, when we feel lethargic, think Willow back when you felt lethargic or flat before a game, because I know you probably did, because players say that to me all the time. Dan, I just wasn't feeling it today. That's when you need to really use your self-talk to drive home that game face. That then you release, you give yourself a chance to release testosterone. That's the underpinning science, the hypothesis here, which helps you feel better, which helps you play better. Not nine out of ten, I'm not saying that, but a better version of bad, if you like. I made a career out of six or seven out of ten, Dan. Well then, and you guys know everybody on this call knows that that's what coach managers will say. I don't want the eight, then three, seven, then four. I want six, six, seven, 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 six, seven, seven, because that's more reliable. That's almost a cliche, isn't it? Dan, I, I don't know if I'm stealing this from you. I, it might be, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I, I remember reading. When you're talking about trying to facilitate that feeling and maybe some barriers that players would have, 
there was a question that you could ask. And the question is, if, if you were to pick, pick the person that you consider to be most elite across any sport, the, the example of elite, um, what single characteristic is it that would define them? And the majority of the answers, almost exclusively all the answers, are psychosocial competencies. They're not necessarily technical. They're not necessarily I'm bigger and stronger. It's it's more that I'm resilient. It's more that I'm, you know, um, I can persevere, that I can bounce back, that I'm courageous, that and and it helps drive that shift from a player's perspective into in towards, you know. A willingness to embrace this and, and and facilitate those those feelings that you you know you suggest are so important yeah i i think you're right i think that if i take the very elite level of sport i think it's because when you add those kind of psychosocial competencies to athleticism uh skill you know all those uh, physicality then you've got people who are athletic, skillful, physical, and they've got those psychosocial competencies. Those are the guys who st- and the girls who stand out. You know, uh, your 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 Venus Williams, uh, sorry, Serena Williams. Um, you know, your Tiger Woods is your Lionel Messi's, Ronaldo's, etc. So I think when you've got your baseline of those and you add those competencies they become the best in the world because they've also got those competencies. Um, So I I think maybe that's how I'd answer that one. Um, But I also think that to give a person the very best chance to be the very best that they can be, then those competencies are enormously important. And then I would also say to be the very best coach you can be. I come back to those three Ps in my psychosocial model of coaching, participation, progression, performance, participation, the soft skill here, overarching soft skill is engagement. How do I engage players, whether I'm under an eights coach, whether I'm Jurgen Klopp? progression it's that key word of learning how do i help players learn you know what we never say we always say i'm doing a coaching session tonight we never say i'm doing a learning session tonight Mm. and that's what progression is we know we're not socialized into how do i help these players learn how do i help them engage how do i help them learn and then obviously that final P is performance. And to me, I'd use the word competitiveness. And again, I think in coaching circles, we're a little bit socialized into, oh, he or she is competitive or they're not. And it's like, there can be an element of hereditary and that might come under the personality dimension of agreeableness. Going back to Willow, your mate, Roy Keane, probably very low agreeable and took that low agreeableness out onto the pitch. And there may be a relationship there. However, I would argue that competitiveness is a skill that can be developed by the kind of skills that we're talking about, game face, et cetera. So engagement, learning, competitiveness, driving participation, progression, performance, to be the best coaches we can be, we need to be able to coach those soft skills there, in my opinion. Perfect. Well, Dan, I'm I'm very conscious that we've now stolen an hour of your time, um, and I think it's clear that we could talk about this for forever. Um, Will, I don't know if there's a, a final closing question or if if you're good to, you know, we're good to bring this to a conclusion. Do you want to? I want a whole other hour on cognitive load theory, but that's a <laughs> that's a, an off uh, off <laughs> webinar discussion that I'm fascinated with, Dan, and I'll pick your brains on it another time. Um, certainly, certainly fascinating Eric can I just uh, would it be possible so I'm not rude to make a, a small announcement about my academy absolutely I was going to say and, and also please Dan share with everybody how they can find you and and listen more and and read a little bit more please feel free so uh, with, with my online academy um, obviously um, with certain circumstances that are going terrible circumstances are going on in the in the world right now uh, i'm doing a, a, a 75 percent um 
reduction on that. Um, so it's £49 for annual membership. Um, and there's over 100 videos in there. Um, there are currently over 70 articles with the kind of things that we're talking about. Um, and I am literally sitting down every single day now and writing articles, especially around my psych social model, because I've had loads of people over the last year or so saying, where can I get more information on it? So uh, I wrote the first article yesterday, every day I'm going to be writing. So uh, that's £49 per annum. Um, and uh, so there's that. And that's it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. Um, find me uh, best on Twitter at uh, at Dan Abrahams 77, uh, at Dan Abrahams 77, giving away my age there. Um, uh, Instagram at Dan Abrahams Sport on Facebook, where I have loads of articles at Dan Abrahams Soccer. Uh, I po art po post an article every day on LinkedIn. So the 95% of my work I give away free. You know, uh, my podcast, uh, my podcast every week is the Sports Psych Show where it's good because I have great guests. I'm rubbish, but my guests are awesome. And so um, I, I can't emphasize how cool that is because they are just brilliant. Um, and yeah, I think that's me. Um, look, guys, thank you so much for giving me the time to, to deliver my rambles. No, Dan, and, and I think I can speak on behalf of everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us and being willing to share you know, I've got a book full of notes scribbled in front of me. And as I said at the, the start of this, guys, um, we will share an infographic that summarizes, you know, a large portion of this conversation, along with the, uh, the full recording uh, across our YouTube and, and Learn channels, learn.beyondpools.com. Um, and Tom, just to say, my, my website, sorry, mate. <laughs> oh, mate, carry on. Dan, danabrahams.com. And that's where you can get on the academy, danabrahams.com forward slash academy. Apologies. Yeah. Dan and we, uh, we can put a link to all of that as well. We'll, we'll do a, a summary with it also. Um, Dan, on behalf of me, Willow, and, and the rest of the team beyond Pulse, thank you ever so much. And for, for everybody on the line for, for joining us and taking this time to, to make yourselves better. So really appreciate it. And uh, for everybody else, we go twice tomorrow. Um, we have Matt Lowry, oh, Chris P popping up. Look at that. We have... Uh, we have Matt Lowry joining us from Atlanta United tomorrow and then Dr. Ed Cope. Um, so we're going to deep dive into some more great, great coaching content there. So Dan, thank you again. Uh, and to everybody else, we look forward to, to catching up again soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>